Happy International Women's Day. Today we have a two and a half hours jam packed with fantastic speakers and great information. The objectives for our event today is to showcase female role models in the cybersecurity industry. We want to inspire women working in the sector to further their careers as well as attract more women to the workforce. We will be running two breakout sessions during today's event, uh, which uh, will help women who want to enter the industry. We will be highlighting the variety of learning pathways that exist. Um, other than non-traditional routes. We also be running a breakout session for women who are working in the sector and want to advance their careers. We'll be sharing smart stories, strategies and top tips from uh, leading industry experts. So to kickstart the event today, I'd like to introduce Simon Hepburn, who is the UK Cybersecurity Council's Chief Executive Officer. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So welcome. Welcome. My first slide. Well, welcome. It's a really I mean, important day for us. Um, it's really important that we celebrate women within the cybersecurity profession and also, exactly as Laura said, also highlight the great opportunities that basically exist. So as Laura said, we have a fantastic group of speakers and panelists on today's session. What I'm going to do is just, you know, many of you will know about the organisation, but I've got five or six minutes to really do a whistle stop tour uh, about the work of the organisation and some of our plans for the future. So part of the history and then moving forward. So part of the history of the council is we ultimately, I think, within the national cyber security strategy of 2016 to 2021, uh, there was a definitely a kind of whole view that important. So we need to develop and credit the cyber security profession, obviously, as a really important profession within the sector. And also that there needed to be a focal point which can advise, shape and inform national policy. So that really was the establishment and the foundations for the establishment of the UK Cyber Security Council. As part of that, there was a formation group that was established and they basically developed a lot of kind of the formation foundation work of the council. And, and part of the outcome of that was really to be clear about the kind of core mission. And that was really for us to be the voice of the cybersecurity profession. And for my, my whole view on it is to be the voice, you need it's important that you listen and you hear. Part of that then was to one, be the regulatory body for the profession, to support the UK government's national cyber strategy, to develop and promote nationally recognised standards and career route maps, and to be the umbrella organisation and umbrella body for existing professional organisations, qualifications and certificates. Part of our core journey really became a real independent entity in March 2021 uh, when the organisation was formally established as its own entity. In July, we were granted charitable status, uh, obviously by the Charity Commission. In September 21, I was appointed as the Chief Exec of the organisation and we also opened our organisational membership programme. In November, we were granted Royal Chartership by the Queen, which was fantastic. Uh, and we was also actively working with NCSC and DCMS uh, and KPMG around the decrypting diversity report and the launch that took place. And this is obviously part of that. And you'll be hearing more from Nikki later on, on the kind of key, key outcomes and recommendations in that report. And in December, the, the national cyber strategy was launched. Within the cyber strategy, uh, you know, I'm always key to really focus on particular areas. So what's, you know, as my chair says, what's our swim lane? So we're very much driven by pillar one and objective two. So one, the ecosystem, and two, to en enhance and expand the nation's cyber skills at every level, including for a world-class and diverse cybersecurity profession that inspires and equips future talent. T today's workshop and today's session is really around this, really around the diverse talent, really about inspiring future talent. At the council, we work. We have four, five key pillars. So one is around obviously development of professional standards. The second is around professional ethics and the whole kind of code of conduct in which we operate. Third is around careers and learning. So really understanding the career route maps into the profession, or for both you know young people joining, but also for career changes. Uh, clarity again of outreach and diversity to really promote this as a profession that people want to join and want to basically be part of and thought leadership and influence really talking truth to power so again being the voice of the sector important that we basically take that that information take the knowledge and share that and inform government policy and information today's session is really focused on the, the, these key three so careers and learning we're gonna have specific sessions and workshops based on the careers and learning really promoting outreach and diversity and there'll be a lot obviously on thought leadership and influencing so that's our focus 
part of the wider ecosystem, we work very closely with all these government departments. And as the UK Cybersecurity Council, we work with devolved administration, so Wales, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And you can see the plethora of, of you know, government departments that we engage with and obviously the organisational members of the council itself. Part of our key plans, I think, moving forward is we've got a, a, obviously DCMS consultation roadshow and our standards roadshow that's taking place at the moment. We've established working groups for our standards, ethics and careers, careers developments. We're developing our strategic plan aligned to the national strategy and we're obviously implementing our chartered organisation status. And the final one there, obviously, it's really important that we develop an organisation that is fit for purpose to deliver on our mission. So we're in the process of doing that, especially as we move towards the new financial year. So just to finish off, my final point is just to say there is a consultation uh, that's taking place at the moment. So obviously by DCMS, it's around obviously embedding standards in, and pathways across the cyber profession. And so really, it's really important for my view that people engage, people comment, you share your opinions and views, because that, that will ultimately you know, inform how we move forward as a profession and as a sector. Closing date is the 20th of March. So again, I would strongly encourage you to, to respond to that document. And so for me, as I said, that was a whistle stop tour. It's an absolute pleasure. Really looking forward to today's session. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back over to Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much, Simon. That's fantastic. Well, without further ado, let's get started jumping straight into the keynote speakers, keeping it in the family. We're starting with Dr. Claudia Natanson, who is UK Cybersecurity Council's chair. She's going to be sharing her story and journey in the industry. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you, Laura. And hello, everyone. And happy International Women's Day. I think um, what I'm going to do today is I, I just want to share with you the kind of things that I keep front in mind um, as I go about um, my journey, as I've had my journey. So I want to share that with you, some of the ways that I think about it and the things that I think about on International Women's Day. And then probably move to the next part, which is about um, sharing my journey a little bit and then <clears throat> how I've taken those things to <clears throat> talk about the council itself. Okay, <clears throat> so I think it's a, it's a great, it's really, really great to be a part of, of the event and this event um, is the brainchild of our CEO and so for this International Women's Day it's really special for me, special because um, being part of it, of the council and part of it working with our CEO on his brainchild here. And it's also a great opportunity and I think a pleasure to be sharing this lot um, with Lindy Cameron and Angelique Faylo, two women who I admire a lot. And then, in fact, Lindy, I remember um, smiling when I heard of her appointment in the role of CEO for the NCSC. And Angelique, um, over the years, is just watching her go about her business with determination and self-belief. So today, I'm pleased that you're able to join the UK Cybersecurity Council and not only our keynote speakers, but all our speakers in the breakout sessions who will help to make the day, I hope, a memorable 2022 International Women's Day. March the 8th is a day when it's a great time for us to step away mentally for even a short period to reflect on our own journeys and, and bring positivity to it. And I think it's a, it's a great occasion for us to send mental strength and hope to so many women around the world who are on their own journeys of hope and who are often experiencing the same and even more challenges that make up the road to success as they try to realize um, their dreams and hopes. And today especially, we remember the women who are experiencing the fallout from the war in the Ukraine and take time to send mental strength, hope and safety for them and their families. Our event today is about bringing <clears throat> diversity of representation, diverse thinking, dialogue and stories of roads well traveled, the successes and the challenges encountered along the way. And it is my hope that as we listen to others, we get strengthened in our own conviction for things that we may want to do. And as we share our experiences, I hope through discussion and collaborative thinking, it verifies that the only failure in reality is the failure of giving up on ourselves. I always have said that the one thing that I will never, never do is give up on me. 
Because if I do, then what would I expect others to do on me? Often we get discouraged. And if we don't achieve something, maybe uh, trying to go for some certification and exam. And I don't know, but to date, I've never yet, and I'm yet to see actually a certificate that tells you how many times a person sat the exam <clears throat> to gain certification. I continue to be inspired by Olympians who train for years to get a shot at winning. And if they don't, they have to go back and re-motivate themselves to go back out and train in pursuit of their dream and their vision. So like them, at the end of the day, what satisfies me the most and helps me draw a line to move to the next thing is the ability to feel satisfied that despite the result, I gave it my 100% at that time. I can then decide that I will dig deeper if I want to continue on that road. And I know that in my own journeys, many times I've had to dig deep to find that conviction and strength in places mentally that I never even knew existed. We all have those hidden places where that extra conviction and reserve of strength live. But we must be prepared to dig deep using our own self-belief to get to those convictions. They are there. That is why it is often so emotional for people who many times have had to find those places of conviction and on finally getting the outcome they dreamed of, we witness their tears and see uncontrollable emotions. And in a way we can see in their heads that they are having a replay of the journey that got them to that point of realizing their dreams. And on occasion, I'm sorry, but I've had to cry with them, <laughs> those tears of joy. So as we experience bumps in the road, so that we grow stronger with these lessons, we must use them to talk ourselves into, not out of things, or else unknowingly, we could have just talked ourselves out of an opportunity of a lifetime. Let me now move on to specifically my own journey and to share some things that I'm hoping I think about sometimes and hopefully it will add to your own conviction of whatever journey you are on. One of the things I do a lot is always think beyond where I am at any given time, at any moment. And that is what in fact brought me to the whole profession of cybersecurity. For quite some years, I was enjoying my career doing atomic spectroscopy as a nuclear scientist. And while working in the laboratory, I began to wonder, mm, we do use and depend so much on computing and that started my challenge to get into the field of computer science. Then, as is now, both in nuclear science as in computing, finding women to work with was almost non-existent. And for me, however, I always totally set out to enjoy the experience and that was the focus of getting through the years in a male dominated field. I found computer science challenging as it was certainly not chemistry and it was strange all the areas that made up the study of it, including so much calculus coding I could understand and the various languages that was given at the time. But the math seemed a strange mix. That is why today I think it's best to encourage people to enter the profession without focusing on whether it is a technical area or this or that. It's like making someone tense before they jump instead of rem making them remain flexible and being able to do, go with the flow and enjoying the experience. That I think will be instrumental in giving people confidence to enter the profession. Over the years, as we attracted more women to the profession, never a lot, but for many women, the hours, especially the 24 by seven job that cyber is, without good support is a lot to ask. And we must create support and safe havens for women as they enter the profession. Today, I think we are wiser. And certainly the pandemic has shown the choices and flexibility of working that hopefully more women will see practical ways in which they can contribute in the profession. While in the profession, the ideas and ways of challenging and doing things differently was always present. And in my first role at British Telecom, 
I use this to pitch my idea of security services to clients, to our CEO. His challenge back to me was, really? Well, show me how. And that was the start of my being able for him to hand over millions of funding for me to set up BT's business, secure business services, and challenge myself. It led to receiving my receiving the CEO's award for challenge and achievement. We did so well in that first year and we have started ever since after that. Again, while I was trying to deliver my vision, there were endless times, I can tell you. I had to talk myself to get self-belief going, to remove any trace of self-doubt. And there was a lot. It's natural, but you need to stay with it. Believe in yourself. And it was about not giving up on myself and staying determined to stay on the journey. <laughs> Quitting is never an option in my book. And it was never going to be an option then. Along the way, you also need to find trusted support. Trusted support that helps you to stay courageous. And in a male-dominated world, it was also male colleagues who played that role for me. Today, and throughout my career, they still remain trusted mentors and friends. Today, women need to ensure we provide those trusted stations and mentorship for other women wanting to enter or who are already in the profession. The final thing I would say in this section is that it is a powerful tool, that of listening. I've done so much listening and hearing from others, hearing their views, their experiences, which together helps me to process my direction of travel and fine tune my vision like a sat -nav. Sometimes I can hear my brain saying, oh, you missed the turn. Make a U-turn when safe to do so. And then saying, recalculating the journey. I hear it all the time. I guess even the sat -nav isn't giving up on me. Let me move finally to the council and how the journeys, the experiences, and what that means for us and I'm bringing to the council as are all the other board of trustee members that I remember today as we, I talk on behalf of the council. So the council is doing its part in helping us create opportunities to find new career pathways for entering a profession in cybersecurity. And on International Women's Day, it is fitting as well for a profession where the percentage of women remains extremely low. A profession where we have to ensure to address the gender balance as our mission also dictates that we place diversity, equality and inclusion into everything we do and support. The council wants to make it simple, simple to understand how to begin a career in cybersecurity, showing diverse pathways, <clears throat> but in a simple, not a complex way. And we want to provide an understanding of the breadth of the practice. So we understand the many skill sets and professional qualification frameworks that can get us started to the area that we may want to practice into. Throughout my career in cybersecurity, it's always very good to work through more than one area. And I moved from area to area. And today I move my teams from area to area. It doesn't matter whether they feel they're in a tech today and for the next months and for the next whatever, you're going to experience a new side to it. Because a lot of times we have to make sure that we understand the total and throughout the whole cybersecurity career for me, moving through all the moving parts that cybersecurity has helps you to have a meaningful dialogue, understanding the holistic end-to-end -end side, all the types of security. I've also had to do physical security. And so you get to understand end to end how it all comes together. We're working with the NCSC to define and develop the standards and the skills we need for the UK to achieve its vision for making the UK one of the safest places to work and do business online. And at the same time, we're also working with government to help influence decisions that will provide a positive impact and in outcome for the profession. The area of ethics and conduct in the profession is something that we will want to ensure is upheld. And so I mentioned that because in cyber, as in a professional capacity, 
integrity is so important. We know integrity of data, integrity of behaviors, and integrity on outcomes. To achieve all this, we know the importance of collaboration for every step of the way. And I feel that this lies at the heart of our CEO's choice of having this event today. That is showing the power and the importance of collaboration. So the cybersecurity practice changes minutely as does technology and so continuous improvement and development is an area that we must be prepared to commit to as an essential part of our profession. And I end today by saying that we shared today the journeys of others as you may be sharing your own journey. I hope we get strengthened to perhaps broaden our own personal career horizons without doubting our abilities. I hope we find ideas for new journeys, career and professional paths. But more importantly, I hope you leave like me resolute that giving up on ourselves must never be an option. I hope you enjoy the day and all that is left for me to say is enjoy a happy 2022 International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, very, very much. That was so inspiring. Uh, some of the, the key pieces I just took away from there, actually, which I absolutely love when you mentioned li about listening to your, your internal sat nav. I think that's a brilliant way of, of, uh, of explaining that. And you, you made a key point about, you know, knowing when or, or understanding that sometimes you have to dig deeper and it's that's that's so important but also the point about never giving up on yourself and that never being an option I think that's that's such a powerful statement um and also the importance of of that trusted support and mentorship that's that definitely is is so important isn't it um and you, you you point there about integrity what you have it underpins everything and um and the power of collaboration I just think that's it's just, you know, really, really, really powerful. Thanks, Laura. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Next, we have absolutely thrilled to uh, introduce Lindy Cameron, Chief Executive Officer for National Cybersecurity Centre. Hi, Lindy. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. So, I uh, hand the floor over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And I mean, thank you so much to, to Claudia for that absolutely inspirational uh, speech just then. I think uh, she is such a fantastic role model uh, for a woman in the profession. It's, uh, it's hard to come after her. So I'm Lindy Cameron. I am CEO of the National Cybersecurity Centre. I've been in the job now for about 18 months. Um, I was going to talk a little bit first about my journey uh, into cybersecurity um, and then talk a little bit more actually about uh, some of the challenges I think we face uh, and what we're doing about them in NCSC. Um, so as I say, I've been in this job for 18 months, but I came to it um, not from a technical background, actually, but from a long career in national security and in international development. Um, but even that was slightly, slightly circuitous route from, from starting off um, after being uh, a history student at university to, to, to being um, a management consultant at McKinsey uh, and then a master's in international relations, international law and diplomacy. So I spent more than 20 years, in fact, alarmingly now, I think, up to 24 years in the civil service across a range of departments in the wider national security space, um, mostly the Department for International Development, but also the Foreign Office, the Cabinet Office, and I worked very closely with our, our military um, in the Ministry of Defence for a while as well. Um, I then spent time in the, in the Northern Ireland office working on domestic policy uh, through some of the challenges of getting the, uh, the Northern Ireland government uh, back up and running uh, and dealing with the challenges of um, negotiating uh, the Brexit deal for Northern Ireland. Um, so I've had a sort of long and varied career, um, uh, but there are some real moments which I think have given me sort of strength as a woman, because I'm one of that generation of women who I think when I left university, never really expected to have to think about being a woman in the workforce. And so I think, you know, it's one of those things that over the years, and I think particularly as I watched, you know, friends and colleagues having children, you know, I realised was a bigger issue than I had ever expected it to. In some ways, I felt like the hard work had been done by previous generations, the suffragettes, our grandmothers, our mothers, you know, who had not only you know, come to the workforce, but also fought for the rights for equal pay, fought for the rights to be taken seriously, fought for the rights to, you know, to, to be, you know, be equal in that workforce, because it's not so long ago. And certainly I was really struck when I joined the civil service to realise um, that it was within my lifetime that women had been forced to leave parts of the civil service, the Foreign Office in particular, on marriage. In fact, when I joined uh, DFID, 
there were ambassadors who had met their partners in the civil service and whose partners had been forced to leave on marriage. So it didn't seem so far away, but it, I felt like a lot of the work had been done. But actually through my career, I think I have realized that there was so much more we needed to do still to make sure that all of the women in the workforce have a real sense of being seen as equal, being taken seriously, and actually can play their full part because there is so much potential that is wasted when women don't, don't play their full part in all of these organizations. So as I say, for me, some of the key moments I think were actually probably some of the most challenging. Um, I was lucky enough to spend part of my earlier career working in some fascinating places, Nigeria, Vietnam, the Balkans. But it was when I went to work in Iraq um, in 2004 um, that I realized I was um, in a very tiny minority. I was working in a heavily military dominated environment. Um, and so I very much felt like the only woman in the room. Um, and in fact, for a lot of the time I was there, I was the only woman in many of the meetings I was in and often the only female civilian as well. Um, and I think it taught me quite a lot about standing up for myself and about making sure my voice was heard. It taught me that actually when you're the only one in the room, people notice you. And in some ways you have to work out how to take advantage of that and use it as a moment to seize the floor and then use that floor for the, the best you possibly can. But what I also learned was the power of working with women together because I was incredibly lucky to have the most amazing all-female policy team when I was there, all of whom faced the same challenges I did in every meeting they walked into. They were frequently the only woman in the room. But actually, you know, I think the power of knowing that we were there for each other, but also the power of recognising the huge diversity of skills and approaches and styles that we all brought to that was in itself a very rewarding and reassuring experience. And it gave us all massive strength in that teamwork, but it also gave us a real sense of the diversity of what we could all offer. I then went on to uh, to uh, be, to be honest, um, the first person from DFID, but also I believe the first woman on the higher command of staff course, the military senior senior staff course in 2008, an experience which was actually a, a particularly um, challenging because nobody had spotted that, uh, that I was going to be the only woman in that particular room. I'd been rung up by the head of the Defence Academy to ask if I would like to participate because they wanted more development experience. Um, and when I walked through the door of that very intimidating, massive military academy with you know, 10 foot high pictures of men in uniform on the walls, uh, Hi everybody, I think we've just got a few technical issues, Lindy's end, so we'll just hang on one moment, see if she's going to be able to reconnect. Just a few points really that I was making there from Lindy's speech um, about the importance of women being seen as equal in the workplace and how she was explaining the, how far we've come in, in, in our lifetimes. Hi Lindy! Oh sorry, <laughs> yeah. did I drop out there? <laughs> a little bit. Apologies. That was probably the GCHD We're back about 40 seconds. <laughs> so, um, so I think I probably got to explaining um, the time I spent in some, had I, had I talked about the Higher Command staff course? Just, uh, sorry, probably, yeah. probably, so I was so I was saying I also had the great experience of being the only woman um, on my course at the Defence Academy, yes. um, which was a, a really powerful experience partly because I hadn't expected that. Um, and so it was a real moment of, of understanding the power of a diverse voice in a room of people with very similar experiences. Um, and I also then had a great experience of being the head of the provincial reconstruction team in Helmand in 2010, uh, where I was leading a civil military coalition of multiple different nationalities, working across different cultures, and really having to bring together that set of, of diverse voices. So what I, what I learned from all of that was the importance of, of using the voice that you have, the importance of building the teams that you need, but also the importance of allies and role models, because at each stage in that journey, I think there were people that gave me the confidence that I could do what I was trying to do, despite being a very different voice. Um, and I think that that was hugely important. I have also really valued the importance of role models through my, my whole career in the civil service and been very lucky to have had some amazing female role models to inspire me and to encourage me on that journey. But then I came to cybersecurity. And as I say, part of the challenge for me in coming to cybersecurity is that I come to it from a broad national security background, not from a cybersecurity background specifically. But again, I think that that shouldn't be a barrier. I think you know, we have a, an astonishing history here at GCHQ. When I look back at the past, there are some absolutely inspirational women who were part of GCHQ's history in the era of Bletchley Park, 
there are some absolutely inspirational women, women who were there in the early days of computing. And so when I look at the workforce that we have now, which is too male, to be honest, across cybersecurity in general and national security specifically, I am confident that those female role models of early days, you know, you teach us that that is not a given. It's not automatic that we need to sit with that and assume that can only be the case. It's something we can challenge. In NCSC, we publish a report called Decrypting Diversity Every Year, which talks to people about the experiences they've had in the industry and plays that back so we can understand it. And it is still the case that women, I think, you know, have more challenges as a result of their gender than men do, un uh, undoubtedly from the data we see. But in particular, I think that there is something about how it is we understand um, understand that experience, help them deal with it, but also help them to recognize the challenge that we can pose to, to that being normalized. And the, we, for example, in NCSC, I think, do a whole set of things to try and change that. The things I'm most proud of that we do in particular um, are the support we give to Cyber First Girls. I was judging the Northern Ireland branch of the competition this year, and there was nothing more inspirational than seeing a group of 12 and 13 year olds absolutely, you know, completely sort of focused on the projects and puzzles they were doing you who were really absolutely delighted to be there, but who genuinely saw themselves as the future of that profession. Similarly, we are really committed to things like Cyber UK that we run to making sure that there are no manuals, that we basically do not allow there to be all male panels, that it is always possible to find diverse voices. And it's important to find diverse voices because we don't want to simply have a situation where we have an echo chamber of people talking to people like them. We want to hear that diversity. Um, so we are committed to making sure that you know, we, are, we recruit a more diverse workforce. We encourage a more diverse profession in general. And we see that because the future of this is so important. Cybersecurity is a massive potential part of the UK economy. It is not just about security threats. It is about massive potential prosperity. And therefore, we think that it is a career and a profession in which it is vital to ensure that women are not just represented, but celebrated and leading. Um, because we think it is a huge part of the future of the UK economy. And we want to be an organisation that helps to champion and celebrate that. And I personally um, take that very seriously and see it as a, as a huge part of my job. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Like Claudia, I also wanted to, uh, to recognise and remember the woman in Russia and Ukraine, particularly in Ukraine, and particularly those fleeing Ukraine at the moment as refugees, um, who are having are particularly hard in her children's day to day um, and who all of I think our, our thoughts and prayers go out to um, as they struggle with life-changing decisions, uh, life-changing career decisions, life-changing life decisions, life-changing family decisions that we can only imagine in our worst in our worst nightmares and I wanted to, to reach out to them and say uh, that we are thinking all of, all of them at this really challenging moment. So thank you and uh, back over to Laura. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Lindy. Just to, uh, to to second that, yes, I think it's important that we that we acknowledge um, our our sisters um, over in Ukraine and Russia who are obviously going through some massively ex life changing experiences at the moment. It's just just sad to think about. Um, but yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Lindy. So. Uh, thank you ever so much. Absolutely inspiring. Again. Um, what I started to say when uh, when you dropped off there briefly was your points about the uh, women being seen as equal in the workplace and how much that has changed in our lifetimes, but still so far to go. It's 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 crazy. Um, the piece that you were talking about, um, you know, being the only woman in the room. God, we've all I think God, most of us online or involved here as speakers today have, have experienced that in one way, shape, or form. And and actually, you know, how how often do we stand up for ourselves, or how long does it take to to build that confidence, stand up for ourselves? And how, it's just so important seizing the floor and using your voice the best way you can is just is 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 just absolutely critical. The importance of teamwork, 100% when you're the minority and to, you know, to actually support each other, collaborate, you know, together we're stronger, right? Uh, the importance of allies, 100%. They don't think people realise how, how important you can be as an ally. It's, it's it, you know, it, it makes such a difference. And role models, that's why we're here today. It's about celebrating uh, women in the industry, leading the way. Um, and those that, you know, inspire and encouraging more to come and join us um, is about celebrating and ensuring that we, we do we do take a part in leading the way. Thank you so much, Lindy. Really, really fantastic uh, to hear, hear your thoughts and experiences. Um, thank you. So next we have uh, Angelique, who is Head of Cryptography for Jaguar Land Rover. She will be sharing her
Hello, everyone. Hi, Hi Angelique. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Angelique Faylow. I work for Jaguar Land Rover, which is in Gaydon in Warwickshire, and I'm the head of cryptography there. Uh, first, I really want to thank Simon and Laura for chairing this event, this International Women's Day, and thank you so much for, for inviting me and considering me for this. Uh, next is obviously Dr. Claudia Natanson. I, I met her when I was at the Department of Work and Pensions in 2016, and I'm really touched and I've got great humility with, that she's approached me to, to speak at this event uh, at a keynote. And then Lindy, I've never met you, but you are incredibly inspirational just hearing, hearing your story. And a lot of the things that you said resonated with me very deeply, like being the only woman in the room. I was just, I was nodding along to everything you were saying. And Claudia as well, when you talk about never giving up and integrity, um, integrity is a theme of my presentation. So yes, just, just ad-libbing hearing the things that you both have said has been wonderful. So Right, I, I will now enter into my keynote, but I do this with the greatest of humility and deference. Um, and I would like to tell you all about my story into cybersecurity into a specialist area uh, of cryptography. Right, so can I get the next slide, please? Click. No, oh, are we able to go to the next slide? Yeah, you, um, uh, Angelique, you're controlling your slides. Okay, so you, yep. thank you. Okay, right. So this event, it's predicated on the theme of diversity and inclusion, and namely for women, as it's International Women's Day. So the thing I would like to discuss is part of my heritage is a quarter Japanese, and there is a word, a Japanese word called kaizen, and that literally translates to change and good. But the way we look at it is it's a sense of continuous improvement throughout your journey. So on the right, I've got, I've got a picture of one of the robots, a Jaguar Land Rover, and, and Kaizen's a, quite a strong theme in manufacturing. You constantly want to continuously improve. So for myself, Kaizen, this journey of continuous improvement, which I am still on, I think the things that have mattered to me in life are hard work and humility and meritocracy and mentoring. So I'd like to go through how that journey of Kaizen has worked for myself. However, before I do that, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about, or everyone in this room, about what it means to be the head of cryptography at Jaguar Land Rover, because I'm aware not, not everyone is going to think, you know, what is cryptography? So cryptography is the art and science of protecting data. And modern cryptography is, is just a form of applied mathematics. So I'm a mathematician. Um, what do I love about this subject? I love cryptography as a discipline because the guarantees of security are provably secure in a mathematical construct. And that's, that's just the way my, my brain has always worked. So, in, you know, in other areas, things depend a lot on heuristics and elements. But, but with cryptography, it's, it's very solid. It's mathematical and that uh, the assurances are, are high. And that's what I absolutely love about it. So Claudia mentioned integrity. So cryptography provides uh, high value data with three main services, which is COPS, we call it CIA, so a bit intelligence there. Um, so C stands for confidentiality. We achieve that through encryption. And then we achieve integrity and authenticity of data through digital signatures. So I guess the question is, what on earth has this got to do with vehicles? What data resides on a vehicle? Actually, as it turns out, quite, quite a lot. So on the screen there, you see this is the interior of our, our latest Range Rover, and you can see the infotainment screen there. So on a new modern vehicle, a Jaguar Land Rover, there is nearly 100 electronic controller units, um, which form part of something called EVA, which is the electrical vehicle architecture. So these ECUs can control everything from infotainment, which is that touch screen that you see. It can do things like advanced driver assistance to help with your lane changing or, you know, any of the safety features in the vehicle. Um, you've got engine and battery control mod modules. So all of these ECUs, they need software to run. And as you can see, a vehicle is just becoming a complex Internet of Things device, which wraps in a chassis and powered by a powertrain. So I'll step back and I leave all the beautiful design and the chassis and the powertrain to the other engineers in the organization. But what my team do is we secure the software that resides on the ECUs, on these electronic controller units as part of EVA, which is the electric vehicle architecture. So I come back to that theme of integrity. 
Um, the cryptographic assurance we provide of the integrity and authenticity of the software is all done through digital signatures using highly, highly protected private cryptographic keys. So why is this important? Let's take a really simple ECU. You can have your automatic wiper blades. So when the rain falls on your windscreen, it can sense it and then your wiper blades will go off. What if someone was to hack that very simple ECU? Well, if your wiper blades were on constantly, then that would be a vehicle recall, which, is, which would be quite difficult. So imagine for a moment the damage that could be done if something critical like the engine control module ECU or the advanced driver assistance ECU was hacked. So that, the, that's quite a big problem for securing people in their vehicles if those things were hacked. Now, the other issue we have is these are connected vehicles. You don't have to just walk up to a port on the vehicle. We deliver software on that infotainment screen that you see through something called SOTA, which is software over the air. And that's really no different to your mobile phone. So in all of these updates coming from Wi-Fi, 4 and 5G, that's an absolute game changer in the needs of cryptography on vehicles. So the scope of what my team does at JLR doesn't only impact like the business, it's business critical, it's also critical for our customers and because a vehicle interacts on the road with other users, it's, it's critical to other road users as well. So that's, that's an overview of what um, the applied mathematics is done at Jaguar Land Rover if, when we use cryptography on a vehicle. So now, how did I become the head of cryptography at JLR? So I'd like to share with you now my story. So when I spoke about Kaizen, I mentioned hard work and humility and, you know, and that's the first part that I want to talk about. So on the left-hand side is, is my favorite Land Rover car. It is the Land Rover Defender. And I think it shows true grit. It's, it's got, there's a lot of work and it can, it can cope with quite a lot of things. And when I think about what Claudia said about never giving up, the Defender is that kind of car. So on the timeline at the bottom, in the late 90s and early 2000s, I worked in the city of London for a company called Bloomberg. I was a network and firewall engineer whilst I was there. It was a very technical role, and I was, as a woman, and I still am, somewhat of an outlier. So what Lindy has said has completely resonated with me. Um, and being an outlier, it comes with positives and negatives. So some people may doubt you based on your immutable characteristics, but a lot of people think really you're inspired by your tenacity to succeed in a male-dominated field. So my advice based on that is you've got to focus on the people that inspire you, the people that provide you with the chance to learn, the people that give you opportunities to expand your knowledge and don't pay any attention to your immutable characteristics in a negative sense. So when I was at Bloomberg, I was you know, young woman in my 20s, and I was working with some extremely experienced ex-British telecom engineers, ex-British signals officers, and I knew when I was sitting with these people that I had a load to learn from them. So I tried to stay, I worked late anytime I could, anytime there was system cutovers, I would do those hard yards, work hard, work with them out of hours and learn everything they could teach me. Uh, Bloomberg was also excellent. They had a wonderful training program. So I took on as much, you know, free work inspired training as I could to learn as much as I could. Um, which was wonderful. It was a fantastic experience being there. Next on the arrows is I, I did work at some, in, still in financial services. I moved from the city to Canary Wharf in the mid 10s and I worked for an interdealer brokerage and investment bank called BGC Partners and Canner Fitzgerald. So Canners is a massively resilient company. It lost 658 people during the 9-11 attacks in 2001. And that made the company such a robust, grounded, resilient company. And it taught me a lot about true grit and you know, what that means. So being in an investment bank, the hours were very long. The trading floor, speaking of male dominated, it was very demanding. And we were also working towards the edge of technological limits, working on high frequency trading algorithmic systems um, to trade US treasuries. So this was an incredibly formative period of my life. And the lessons I took from being at Canners were the importance of teamwork under that kind of pressure, the, the way you rely on, on a team of people to get, to get through very, very tense days. Um, 
That said, I think now in my 40s, I'm not sure I could handle that environment again. But yeah, what it taught me was that I was made of tough stuff. I didn't know I could do those sorts of hours. I didn't know, you know, how it would feel to work with a team under such pressure. But yes, and, and working on such technologically advanced systems, um, we were doing with high frequency trading, you, you can do upwards of 20,000 trades per second. It was microsecond level trading. So really exciting things. Um, next, I move on to, well, where I met Claudia in the next era, which is in Her Majesty's government at the DWP. So I never worked for central government. So after 15 years in financial services, it was quite a change of scenery for me. Um, but I wanted to see the rest of this country. I moved to the UK in 1999 from Canada and working for central government gave me the opportunity to travel around and do security architecture work. Now, what hit me when I was doing work for central government was the unimaginable scope to change people's lives in this country. It, again, it was so, so humbling. Some of these systems like winter fuel payments, universal credit, personal independence payment, and many, many more. The scale of the responsibility was, again, hugely humbling. Um, this is where I met Claudia, and she was such a motivational person to, to be around. I woke up every day realizing the scope and scale of what was at stake at the DWP. I was so motivated to do my work there. And yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. However, uh, and you will see on the right hand side, that is the Founders Building at Royal Holloway. So I had a skeleton in my closet by the time I was in my mid thirties. And I, I've, I've got a, I had a BSc in mathematics at that point. And what I really, really always wanted to do was more applied mathematics. And um, so I applied to do a master's at Royal Holloway in mathematics of cryptography because I wanted to specialize very deeply in this, in this subject area. So in 2016, uh, this is the next part of, of the Kaizen journey, which is humility. In 2016, I applied to do my master's at Royal Holloway. Um, and that was a big step for me, a woman in her mid thirties. I knew I would be working with students that were in their early twenties. And again, much humble pie to have when going back to university. Um, but I was around these incredibly young, talented, gifted, intelligent mathematicians. And even though they were younger than me, they could absolutely school me with their knowledge on the subject matter when compared with myself. I learned so much from what I guess what we deem millennials, these, these people born in the 90s. And it was such a wonderful experience because this is the next generation. Um, and so I duly went on, returned to academia. I graduated with distinction and I'm incredibly proud of that. And that, that now takes me on to the next part of my journey which is what I believe in is meritocracy. So on the Kaizen journey, we talk about meritocracy and mentoring. So what's my advice to young women striving to start their careers? So let's go back to a continuous improvement. I spoke to you about hard work and um, humility. So let's talk about meritocracy and mentoring. So my first belief is that as women in cyber, if you want to succeed, there's one thing and one thing alone that you should succeed on, and that is merit. So I don't believe we're trophies. I don't believe that we should get to our positions and status and our eruditeness on anything other than our merit. So how do you achieve merit, in my opinion? Well, first and foremost, you have a passion for the subject matter that you want to study. The next is authenticity. Bring your true, authentic, uncensored self that diversity of thought, that diversity of opinion that Lindy spoke about, that's, that's essential and, and express it. That's so, so important. Um, the next is do the hard yards. When Claudia talks about never giving up, absolutely don't. Pick the things that you want to learn, things with high barriers of entry to learn, difficult subjects. You will absolutely surprise yourself how much your brain is capable of doing with, with absolute grit and hard work. Um, next part is we have meritocracy. So you get to my age in the middle of your career in your 40s and you realize you're not an apprentice anymore and other people may look at you as a role model and an inspiration. It's, it's a difficult thing to kind of acknowledge is happening actually because I think a lot of women, um, well I definitely suffered from imposter syndrome um, being the outlier. I didn't always trust what I was 
what I was doing or that my opinion mattered. So, but you can embrace that because you've got that confidence. You know, you've done the hard yards. You know that, you know, the things that you've done have led you to the things that you've done in, you know, for myself, it's in cryptography. And then you sit and remember, you remember the other role models that you had. For example, in my case, it was it was Dr. Claudia Natanson. Also, one of my current role models, I'm, I'm currently completing my PhD um, in applied mathematics of cryptography. And my other role model is another wonderful woman who's my PhD supervisor, Dr. Elizabeth Qualia. She's so supportive, so hardworking, and I'm I'm thrilled that I'm on her PhD lineage. So I'm at the tail end of completing my PhD in a subject that I absolutely love, uh, Applied Mathematics of Cryptography. And I believe when we look at Kaizen there, so my head of crypto PhD in Kaizen, I believe in continuous improvement, that change for good. I feel like I'm always gonna be a student, um, that perpetual learning, it, that comes with humility. I want to be humble, I want to learn for the rest of my life, but I also feel at this point, I'd like to pass on the torch of my experiences to the next generation of young and gifted women, which are all of you and more on this call. So just to give my closing statement, I feel incredibly blessed on my journey that the subjects that I've learned in academia with my master's in mathematics of cryptography, with what I'm completing with my PhD, that I also get to apply that subject matter to Jaguar Land Rover um, it's incredibly satisfying to do that. So to quote Mark Twain, if you find a job you enjoy doing, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that's, that is absolutely uh, true of my life at the moment. And thank you very, very much for all of that. And I would also like to acknowledge the, the women in, in the Ukraine and Russia and the struggles that they are going through and their, my thoughts and prayers are with them immensely. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Angelique. That was absolutely fascinating. What a journey you've had and experience. Wow. Where do we start? <laughs> I just really, really, I really love the um, the diagram you put up with the explanation around Kaizen and, and how each part it relates to, to um, the important pieces around continuous improvement. I just, is something that, that myself and my colleague talk about continuously every day, continuously every day, um, and, you know, really drumming it into uh, entry level students and not, you know, and those that are experienced as well is the importance of that because you can't ever stop learning based on, on you know, how this industry moves and at such pace, it's, you can't afford to. And it, I think it was, um, Claudia mentioned earlier about you know your, your understanding and your your knowledge around around the, the cybersecurity domains and the importance of having that holistic view and understanding to be the best professional you can be. So we're, we're continually going to be students, right? We're always going to be learning. But what made me smile myself actually because I really really identified with that when you said about when do you realise actually you're not an apprentice anymore? You know, when are we growing up now? We're in our forties, and, and, and God, yeah, we do learn so much from millennials. So that makes me feel really old. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting transition though when you realise, and, and it's the deference that people pay because in your mind you're still this, you know, you're still this young. You're like, no, gosh, your people are looking up to me. I've got to, you know, you've got to step up. And it's yeah. and it's odd, I think, with imposter syndrome and things that you know, I think as women we we experience being in the industry, and you're like, oh wow, I'm I'm that woman that people might actually look up to, and it's yeah, it, it's an interesting journey. Yeah, and it's perhaps a debate and something we could talk about a bit more detail during the Q and A because you know the environment we we are we grow up in from a from a professional perspective, you know, potentially or, or you know. It, in a lot of cases perpetuates those feelings and those thoughts about you know are we worthy can we do it are we good enough are we are we you know are we seen as equal um i know you know my that's how what i experienced and and you know lindy um explained similar so it's it's a really really interesting debate yes so hopefully we can we can bring that a bit later but true grit yeah 100 percent. we don't yeah it's I don't think we don't realise actually what we're capable of until we look back and go, wow, how did I get through that? <laughs> um, and yeah, passing on the torch, 100 percent. It's it's so it's so important. And actually, um, one of my my, my WISIS colleague, Molly, is going to talk about that uh, shortly in our in one of our breakout sessions. So so 
definitely we, we're kind of seeing the same themes that we're you know we're all aligning with already uh we're, we're only part way through the event so brilliant thank you so much angelique and uh, we will catch up with you in a bit during the q a thank you wow i hope you all enjoyed that that was amazing so next we have our breakout sessions so we have breakout room one, which is for any of you that are hoping to get into the industry or aspiring to get into the industry. Um, we will be, uh, my colleague Natasha Harley will be chairing the session about how to get into the profession. Um, she will be showcasing with uh, an amazing panel the different training pathways available to, um, to enter the industry. And I will be chairing breakout room two, which is our mastermind group, Women Who Break Barriers. We will be providing advice and top tips and strategies to help challenges or, or issues or stumbling blocks that you come across um, in your, you are coming across, sorry, in your career at the moment and um, we want to inspire you to, to further your career. So you will need to uh, go to either breakout room and choose which one you want to join, please. We also have a poll, please can you, um, take part, give us your feedback, um, your, your, your thoughts and feedback is really important to UK Cybersecurity Council and WESIS UK to help, help um, shape opportunities and support for all of you. So without further ado, let's move over to the breakout rooms. <laughs> 